Hello, hello. Please uh, take your seats. I'm very, very happy to see that we actually got a good crowd, which is wonderful. Thank you all for coming in this gloomy, rainy, rainy day. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Marcelo Gleiser, and I am a professor of physics and astronomy here at Dartmouth. But I also run the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement. And I call it the good eyes, so that there is no confusion about what kind of eyes we are talking. You know, and it's, it's very important to make that distinction right now. Um, so what we do is we try to bring scientists and humanists together to discuss questions that we call the big questions of our time. And these are questions that if you look at them just from, one, from a one-sided perspective, be it scientific or humanistic, you are not going to get the full picture. You know, there are questions that we're asking today about the world in which we live in that really need a pluralistic way of thinking, right? And so the goal of this institute is to promote a series of different events uh, so that we can do this, that we can have these conversations. And one of the things is exactly what you're doing here today is what we call the public dialogue, right? And the public dialogue is when I have colleagues from the sciences and humanities, we pick a topic and we go at it, right? Now, we've been doing this, this is our third year now, and we are generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And we're trying to keep the money coming for, so that we keep doing this for more years to come. Um, and that is why when you sat down, you probably sat on a piece of paper, which is a survey. And it turns out that these grants require quantitative statistical analysis of what people think of what we're doing so that, yes, it's good, it's not good. And I really, really uh, would ask you to take just two minutes to fill up this because, and then they're gonna be collected at the exit um, because that will help us to keep doing this for longer. Just to give you an idea, idea this is our public dialogue number eight. Uh, it's the first one that we do here at Dartmouth. We have done them in New York, in San Francisco, in Chicago. Um, our most recent one was called uh, On Mortality and Immortality. And we had Siddhartha Mukherjee, who wrote the, the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, got the Pulitzer Prize for it. And we had Elizabeth Colbert talking about the sixth extinction, the mortality at the planetary scale, right? And, uh, and uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about something related but with a different focus, which is what we're calling on being human, okay? And I'm going to introduce everybody as things go along. We have a special surprise. We have never done this before, but we have an opening act as well, which is a wonderful thing. We have a dance company with live music, which is going to perform because we dance, we humans dance, right? And not just for courtship, we actually dance for many other reasons. And so I'm really, really honored and excited that the Passing Project is here uh, to be with us. Before I introduce them though, I would like to show you a 90 second video about ICE so that you understand what it is that we do in a more general perspective. Everything that we do, all the public dialogues, we have fellows lectures, we have interviews, we have massive online courses, everything is archived on that website there. We have over 40 hours of videos, a virtual library, all sorts of resources for people that want to engage in this conversation. The world is a complex place, a network of flowing information and changing patterns where forces known and unknown generate the most sublime beauty and the most terrifying destruction. The world inspires wonder and doubt, and we humans try to make sense of it all, creating stories, theories, symphonies, and poems. I am Marcelo Gleiser, director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth, or ICE. On behalf of all of us at ICE and our partners, I invite you to be a part of our institute, to be a part of this very essential conversation. What is the nature of reality? What is the future of humanity? Will machines think? Will and should we become immortal? Is there free will? Are we alone in the universe? 
can science be a path towards spirituality? ICE was created to address these issues and establish new bridges between different ways of knowing. Our mission is to overcome old bigotries and facilitate a constructive dialogue between intellectuals and the general public, creating a community of citizens concerned with the common good, engaging experts, promoting public dialogue, and offering open access courses. One thing is certain, the hardest questions ask for different viewpoints, for a cross-disciplinary approach, for intellectual openness. The sciences and the humanities need one another now more than ever, and we need them both. So, thank you very much. Um, okay, now I'm very, very happy to introduce the Passing Project. So the Passing Project was conceived by dancers Tracy Penfield and Tamara Hurwitz Pullman upon reflecting on the passing of loved ones. What has been passed on to us? What will we pass on? And what are the passing stories that we share? Being human brings with it the consciousness of death and of dying. From early in childhood, we gain the comprehension that someday we will die. Once we have this knowledge, our lives are colored by it in our thoughts, our actions, and the risks we take. It becomes a presence in our imaginations. And while we are relational beings by nature, we contemplate dying and passing, each in our unique destiny. We have with us today two musicians and three dancers from the Passing Project, Carl Pepperman on keyboard, Phil Thorne on, on clarinet, and dancers Tracy Penfield, Otto Pierce, and Bridget Struthers. Tonight, the musical, musical and kinematic, kinesthetic, sorry, reverie kinematic is a physicist problem here, sorry about that. <laughs> Kinesthetic Reverie is a celebration of life, a structured improvisation on being human. So, Tracy, please.
guys have a hard time now to, 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 to follow this. Thank you so much, Team 5, for, for this very moving experience. So being human is a multidimensional thing, right? We, um, we are animals in one sense, and we have to sleep, we have to eat, you know, our nails grow, our hairs grow, so we have this dimension to our existence is completely animalistic. And on the other hand, we have these creatures which are really made out of stardust, right? We are made of atoms of carbon and nitrogen. And these atoms are older than the sun and the earth. They came from stars that exploded around 5 billion years ago. So we are very, very old stuff indeed, you know, when we talk about what we are made of, the stuff in your bodies. And yet, you know, we have this chemistry, we have this animalistic behavior. On the other hand, we are also creatures capable of thinking about the infinity, right? Of thinking about the divine dimension, spiritual dimension, creativity. We have this urge to make sense of things to matter in the world and in our lives. So this is sort of like the focusing theme of, of tonight's presentation. And I'm really happy to have three wonderful people to talk about this. They're going to talk about the human perspective in, in different ways. I'm going to have Tasneem Hussain, who is a former string theorist from Pakistan, 
with a postdoctoral from Harvard, and she's also a novelist now. She's going to talk about humans as storytelling creatures. Then I'm going to have Jerry De Silva, who is a professor here of anthropology, the guy that actually goes down to Africa and excavate bones of our ancestors to make sense of who we are from an anthropological perspective, where we came from, you know, that way. And he's very interested in bipedalism, which I have to say, this was absolutely perfect. When I saw you guys going like this, I said, Jerry must be loving this, because that couldn't have been more topical. Um, and then we have uh, David Greenspoon, who is an astrobiologist, and who is also an author and a very popular science. Uh, uh, he's a very big science popularizer. Now, I want to introduce all of them, and we're going to do it this way. Um, they each will have about 15 to 20 minutes to talk. And then we're going to be here on stage. We're going to talk to one another. I'm going to ask them a few questions. And then we're going to open to Q&A from you, OK? And we're hoping that the whole thing is going to wrap up around 6.15 to 6.30. We'll see how it goes. Depends how excited you get and asking questions and stuff. Um, so let me start with Tasneem, who's going to be the first. So Tasneem Zara Hussein came to writing via theoretical physics. She received her PhD from Stockholm University in Sweden and pursued postdoctoral research at Harvard before returning to her native Pakistan as a founding faculty member as an, at an elite school of science and engineering. She's particularly passionate about the need for a more nuanced, more human paradigm in science writing one that is truer to both the process and the spirit of the endeavor. Tasneem has conducted several writing workshops for scientists, including an ongoing series at CERN. For those of you who do not know it, CERN is this very big laboratory for particle physics in the border between Switzerland and France. It is actually the biggest machine ever built in the history of civilization that achieves the highest energies when it collides little bits of stuff and we do this so that we break things to see what's inside and how, what are the things we can make with the energy of what's inside. And that's what CERN is. Her writing has appeared in Nautilus as well as various anthologies of science writing for both adults and children. She's a regular columnist for threequarksdaily.com and the author of the popular science novel, Only the Longest Threads. For over a decade, Tasneem has been actively involved in outreach. She has worked with K-12 teachers, high school students, and government officials, both in the US and abroad, and is a frequent speaker at book festivals, science festivals, writing conference, and physics conference. So please, let's all welcome Tasneem. Thank you, Tasneem. So um, can everyone hear me? That sounds good. So first of all, I just wanted to thank Marcelo for the invitation. Um, I've seen, I've been following these public dialogues since before I became a fellow uh, at the center. And it's been such an illustrious group of people. I'm really proud and honored to be invited to be a part of this. And I'm particularly happy to be um, at the dialogue that comes back home. So as Marcelo said, they've been at all sorts of venues all over the country. But this is the first that's happening at home in Dartmouth. And I'm very happy to do that because I feel it gives us a chance to share with the Dartmouth community everything that we have experienced at the Institute uh, as fellows. So I don't know how the conversation will go today. I don't know what David and Jerry are going to say. But I do know that it will be exactly the kind of conversation that I have had at the center. There are people who've thought deeply about things from their own points of view but are very open to hearing other people's perspectives. Because the big questions, like Marcelo said, um, they're not questions that we're going to be able to answer just from one point of view. We need to come together. So um, pretty much what you're going to see today is you know, a day in the life of this institute. Um, so with that, let me start. Um, so when Marcelo told me what this topic was, I was like, could it be anything <laughs> less expansive than this? It's just, you know, <laughs> on being human, I mean, what do you say? So I was trying to come up with, well, what do I know about this? What can I say about being human? Um, 
And one of the first things that jumped to mind, so I was just sort of making a list of notes for myself, you know, what can I come up with? And one of the first things that jumped to mind was this, that we are storytellers. Um, we always have been, uh, since time immemorial, in every tradition all over the world. Stories have been a way that we convey our culture, our traditions, we pass on um, wisdom you know, through the ages. And um, I don't know if you've, have you heard of the Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson? He's also a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, he had this little sentence that I loved. He said, stories, the stories we tell ourselves are our survival manuals. And that's kind of true, right? Because it's a way of encoding information that you want to pass on, but making it emotionally relevant. So you remember a story the way you would not remember a fact. And if someone wants to tell you something that you know, they want you to, to be able to recall in the years to come, they sort of make a little story about it. And that's what our, our ancestors knew intuitively and have been doing. So um, ancient stories that are still remembered today you know, about things like, don't go too close to this mountain because if it's rumbling, because it will rain fire or something like that. Um, you know, to, about volcanoes. And th there are stories like that in pretty much all cultures about different things. And those stories were one of the ways that mythology came about. Because we looked at the natural world, there were things that we understood, there were things we didn't understand. And we wanted to find ways of connecting them somehow to make a consistent um, story out of them. And you know, that's, that's the origin of mythology. Uh, so stories evolved to explain the natural world, to make some sense of things that would otherwise be random. You know, it's this thunder because Thor is throwing down thunderbolts or, or whatever the case might be. So all over the world, there are these different myths. There are some common uh, themes that are, that are universal, no matter what the culture. Um, but a lot of the, the myths are indigenous to you know, the place, the people, Everyone has come up with things that make sense to them in their culture, in their context. Um, but that's not the only kind of story we have. We've also, um, again, from I think the time that people started traveling, we've had travelers come back and tell stories. Um, and that's been a way to find out about other places, other cultures, especially in the centuries past when travel was not very, well, travel is not exactly a piece of cake right now either, but when it was much more difficult and you know, took much longer and um, much slower and not everybody got to travel, uh, travelers would come back. They were you know, sent off on these expeditions to see what they could find about other cultures. And if you read travelogues from the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, they're literally looking at other people and other cultures as if there's a strange kind of you know, magical element to them. It doesn't necessarily makes sense. Some of the things are, you know, are exaggerated. Um, there's often some element of fantasy, even, you know, slight mythic uh, things thrown in there. So um, I grew up in Pakistan, and one of the, the traditions that we have there is um, this tale of Amir Hamza. It's, it's like, um, it's an epic almost. It goes on and on and on and on. And it's been there since the time of the Mughals, so it's like 1400 um, AD. And it's based on a historical figure. So there was this actual person called Amir Hamza, and it tells of his adventures. So, and some of them are true and some of them are, are not. You know? So it tells of his travels, where he went, things that make perfect sense, and suddenly he'll come up against a jinn, or you know, he'll come up against like, some kind of weird mythic monster. So um, these places were so different, and the things that people saw were so different, and they did not sometimes have a parallel for them, that they projected all of their fantasies onto it as well. So it became this strange amalgam of fact and fantasy, and it just sort of um, you know, rolled in together, and it's hard to, it was hard to tell uh, which was which. So we have stories that, that we tell to make sense of the natural world. We have stories that we tell or we listen to to find out about things that we do not necessarily see or experience, so ways to enlarge our, um, our vision of the world. Another thing, so this is one of, this is the first thing that came to my mind. It's like, okay, we're, we're human, what makes us human? One of the first things we do instinctively is we tell stories. Another thing we do is that we look for pattern. Again, this is almost instinctive. 
um, if you see some kind of random amalgamation of anything, there is this urge, there's this instinct to just kind of group it together, to make sense of it somehow, to link it so that um, you know, there's some kind of scheme to it. So we organize, we classify, we group things, we look for patterns. Um, you know, motifs that are repeated, anything that could hint at some kind of an underlying structure. So when we see apparent randomness, we're always looking for, subconsciously, we're always looking for, okay, well, what's behind this? Like, there has to be something more predictable, something more structured behind this. Um, and the reason I put up the periodic table of the elements was that this is, what, this is the exercise that led to the periodic table. So you start classifying, you have all of these elements, right, this proliferation of these elements that seem to not necessarily have much to do with each other. Some of them are linked, some of them are not. We don't know what's happening. So you try and group them in a way that makes sense by their atomic weight. And then you begin to see a structure and you begin to see um, a pattern. But the power of this is not just to organize or collate what we have that already exists um, in front of us. The, the reason I think that we seek patterns, again, this is my opinion, this is not a very, um, it's not an academic statement, it's, it's a personal statement, but I think the reason we do that is because we want to predict what comes next, right? So whatever you have in front of you, you could group it in several different ways, but the real interest, the real fun comes when you can group it in a way and then you find some missing you know, pieces to it, and then those missing pieces turn up. And that's how you know that you came up with a structure that makes sense. So that happened with the periodic table. That's what happened with the standard model uh, of particle physics. We had all of these particles that we discovered and they were grouped together in a way that was coherent, that made sense. But there were missing pieces. And that's how you proved that you come up with the right structure because you predict something that's not there just on the basis of the pattern, right? So if this pattern makes sense, then there are these holes in it that should be plugged by something. I know what that something looks like. It's like a jigsaw piece. You have, you know, you've completed the whole thing. There are like six or seven puzzle pieces missing. You know what the shape is. You know what the image should be on them to link to the whole thing. And when you find them, you're like, okay, well, I linked them correctly. This was the right way to do it. Um, and that's where, where science comes in. Um, because to a large extent, that's what we're, we're doing. Um, in science as well. We're looking at the world around us. We're organizing things into a scheme uh, that is coherent, that makes sense. And then we make predictions about, okay, well, if this was such and such, then we should expect you know, this thing to happen in the future. Um, okay, another thing that makes us human is this urge we have to, <coughs> excuse me, is this urge we have to um, fill in the blanks. So this is like the standard black box, right? You have an input, you have an output. And you can train pretty much any animal. It's like that you know, Pavlov's dog's experiment. You give someone an input and an output. So the dog does this, you give it a treat or, or whatever it is. Like most animals, you can train like that. If you do this, you will be rewarded. If you do this, you will be punished. So there's an in and an out over there, right? If this is the input I give, then this is the output I receive. Um, animals are capable of doing that. I don't know if this is exclusive to human beings, what I'm going to say, but I know it's definitely a feature of being human, is that we instinctively start projecting things onto the black box. So you'll see something happen, you know, in, if I put this in, this comes out, I put this in, this comes out. You see it enough times and just almost, um, it's this urge, right? It's almost this instinct without even meaning to, you start conjecturing okay, well, maybe this is what's happening inside the box. And, you know, maybe this is what it is. So, and, and that could be anything. That could be, um, you know, a story that you tell children. It could be, well, there are these little fairies inside the machine and, you know, they're doing this, that, and the other, and that's how, um, that's what happens. Or it could be, um, and actually the, the advantage of doing it this way uh, is that then when there's a deviation from the norm, you can absorb it, right? Because if you've, attributed it to gods or fairies. Well, these are famously whimsical characters. You know, the gods are fickle. Um, everything is going according to plan. You know, Thor always does this, this, this. And then there's a freak thing that you can't explain. You're like, oh, well, you know, he had a bad day. He was in a temper. 
or you know, the fairies decided. So, so it has that kind of flexibility, right? Where you can just blame it on um, whimsy or you can sort of accommodate those departures from expectation by just saying, you know, those are the vagaries of fate. This is how they, they behave, um, which is why this is not science. But there is a kind of a um, black box in science as well. So we can you know, come up with some kind of a physical mechanism. We postulate, okay, well, this is what happens. Um, and this is what I put in and this is what I uh, get out. And this is actually something you can check. So you can make predictions. And if the prediction does not work, then here you don't get to see you know, the machine change its mind. You don't get to do that. So you know that whatever you postulated was, was wrong. Um, and even here, and that, that's happened several times before, there are models that work uh, for a while and then they break down and then you realize, well, whatever you had thought of that internal machinery, whatever picture you had projected onto it, whatever uh, story you had come up with was not quite the right one. And um, it would work for a long time. For instance, there was, uh, the discovery of the general theory of relativity about 100 years ago by Albert Einstein happened because there was a slight depart. So the orbit of Mercury could be explained pretty much by Newton's theory, which is what I think we still learn in high school, um, just up to a tiny deviation. Or the fact that sunlight should deflect around, uh, that uh, a ray of light should deflect around the sun starlight um, was also a part of Newton's theory. It's just that the amount by which he said it would turn, by which whatever construction he had made inside the machine, um, did not quite give the same thing. So it could be like a tiny difference in the input and output that causes you to rethink your whole theory. And you could, you know, you come up with something more streamlined, more modern, more off the moment. And this has the correct prediction for now. So this is what we go with for now. The one thing I do want to mention, though, is that we, we still, the, the old model, so this fanciful, I'm going to push my luck and see if I can go back. Uh, no. OK, good. Um, so this is still true to a certain extent, right? It's like when we tell children stories, there are things that have a lot of wisdom. When I tell them to a five-year-old, I'll tell them one way. When the same child is 15, I can add a few things onto it, right? So there is a sort of relevance for how coarsely grained something is or how much detail you want to go into. If I'm explaining something to a child, I could say this, and this is still true to a certain extent. If you're measuring things up to a certain um, you know, degree of accuracy or if you're only interested in a child telling a, a cat apart from a dog, well, then there are only certain things they need to know. But as they grow older, they want to go into more you know, intense classifications and, and realize more subtle differences. Then they have to upgrade their model, which is why um, in science, our theories keep, keep evolving and, and changing. Um, one of the things, so one of the ways that I think about it is it's almost as if you're streamlining things. You know, like if you have um, a camera lens and you're focusing it and you're looking at something, you can have like a slightly blurry object where you make out certain uh, attributes of what you're seeing and not others. And then you keep focusing sharper and sharper and sharper. So when you're looking at it in this blurry way, you could have, you know, it could be this, it could be that, it could be a third thing. And then when you focus in and you're looking at it really sharply, you see what the structure is. So that's kind of what we're doing with science, which is why it keeps changing, which is why I think it's justified in a way to call science a story as well. Right? Because we're trying to come up with a story that makes sense. This is the universe we see. This is the behavior we see. Well, what kind of a story would it be? What kind of uh, connections would we have between these two points that would make sense? One of the things that I want to stress is that all of these are different layers. They're different layers of understanding. And we are capable of holding them in our brains simultaneously. So it doesn't take away from one to know the other. You know, I could tell my three-year-old son a little fairy tale about what thing, how this happens. I could write down the equations of general relativity. If I had to make a calculation that was a, a rough enough calculation, I could still use Newton's equations to do that. I wouldn't 
go to the more extreme ones. So the point is there are all different layers of understanding, there are different perspectives that you have on this one thing, which by the way is, is unknowable and, and unseeable by definition, right? We don't get to see the cogs and wheels of nature actually at work. Um, I happen to be in love with the theory of re general relativity, but I'm not saying it's the final answer because we happen to know that it's not. Um, there are modifications that will be needed. But when those modifications are needed, how much will it change about the character of what we know about gravity? We don't know. We don't know what the next layer will look like exactly. But again, it, it'll just be one more layer. So we, when we hold these together in our minds, we are able to develop a more nuanced view of what lies inside. Um, and none of them is absolutely literally true, right? Even general relativity, we know that now. Um, and the way I like to think about it is, have you ever done that experiment with your eyes where like if you hold up your finger and you close one eye and you close the other? Do you mind doing that for a second? It's, it's kind of fun to see it happen. So you put your finger in front of your nose more or less and then you close one eye and you see the finger in one place. You close the other eye and the finger seems to shift, right? You open both eyes and, and then you can see where it is. So the question is, which is the right position? I mean, the finger didn't shift, right? So is the left eye right or the right eye right? Well, the fact is they're both right. They're both right in their own way, right? But there's too many rights in one sentence. But the point is, the point is the fact that they, the reason you see the finger in, in different places is because your eyes are physically separated, right? And what that gives you is the ability to perceive depth. That's kind of how I think of these different layers, is that each one of them is one perspective on, it's one story, right? It's one perspective on what's happening. And if you're able to hold them together in your mind, that gives you a kind of a depth of understanding that you wouldn't have had if you insisted on sticking to just, you know, just the one way of thinking. Um, but these, layers of meaning and the fact that things have layers of meaning, this is something that's intuitively familiar, right? Even from childhood. Um, you can see, I think children as young as two or three roughly is when they start to engage in pretend play. So you can you know, give a child a banana and say, here, I'm calling you on the phone. I don't know if that'll still work 10 years from now when they've never seen like an analog phone. Maybe it'll have to be something flat. Uh, and tablet looking, but you get the general, you get the general picture. You can put a box and you can say, you know, well, this is a house um, or, you know, just anything like that. Uh, and children that young have the ability to see something for what it is, literally, but also and simultaneously something else, right? You realize that this is an inborn innate instinct even like a three-year-old would not question, but what do you mean it's a house, it's a box, you know, is it a house or a box? They can see that it's a house and it's a box. It's both things at the same time and there's no real contradiction. So literally it's a box and I'm thinking of it as if it were a house. And that uh, is crucial, I think, because it leads to the ability to create representations, right? So, Eventually, we learn to graduate from those literal representations. So I want a house and I'm you know, picturing it as a box. So I have this physical object and I am thinking of it as something else. You can graduate from that to mental representations. And you can, it's almost like you're extracting the physical idea from the physical, the, the essential idea from the physical manifestation of it. So you're, you're literally abstracting out ideas and, and you start manipulating that in your mind and that's what symbols are for. That's what mathematical symbols are for, right? Each of them represents a physical concept, a variable of just something that you see in nature, a process, an object, the temperature of something. Um, and you can manipulate them in your mind using just, um, just these symbols. So the capacity for abstract thought, which is, I think, the, the root of so much human activity, but in particular, uh, the mathematical sciences, which is um, my background. So, 
so I feel this quite strongly. Um, it comes from, from play, right, from making up these little stories about things. So to that extent, um, let me go back to the beginning. So when I was thinking about what's, what it is to be human, I said, okay, well, we're, we're storytellers. Then we look for patterns. Then there was, okay, we, we try and fill in gaps. Um, you know, we make up theories. We have this ability for abstract thought. But in some sense, it's, it's kind of coming together, right? A theory is also a kind of a story. You have a cast of characters. You have things that a, th a theory will deal with. Um, if it's statistical mechanics, it will explain a particular set of things. You have uh, a set of rules. You have a setting. You have a background. And that thing evolves. So, so you, when you ask questions, your answers are also stories, in a sense. Then the, this abstract thought thing got me thinking. And I was like, OK, well, we have the ability for abstract thought. What else does this lead to? And here is something oh, wrong direction. Um, this is a very grainy picture, I know, but it's the best one I could find. So these are trenches uh, in World War I. And a, a more gloomy place, I think, would be difficult to imagine, not because worse things don't happen to people or equally bad things, but I think it was the first time that something was happening on this global scale. And, um, you know, and we didn't know what to do with it. It was just completely unexpected. But even in these surroundings, uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who was a, an astrophysicist, uh, a physicist by training, he was in the trenches. He was summoned there to calculate artillery trajectories, right? We're going to throw this bomb. Where will it land? Um, not bomb, cannons and, and artillery. And he was able, just because of this ability for abstract thought, to remove himself from these physical surroundings. And he sat there in those trenches, and he came up with this solution for a black hole, which is something we are only now beginning to figure out how to see 100 years later. So that capacity for abstract thought to sort of lifts you out of the physical surroundings into this other space. It's the same thing with prison cells. There are so many amazing stories, like Marco Polo's travels he wrote when he was in prison. Martin Luther King wrote when he was in prison. The point is that you're able to remove your physical surroundings. So sort of they retreat in the background. And you're able to create this world in your mind. So those are all the things that I was sort of holding in my head together. And I guess what I came up with in the end is that, OK, we're pattern-seeking, meaning-making, curious, questioning, tellers of tales. And, um, and then you, we take what there is, and you, you sort of multiply it. You add these layers to it, and you send it back as something that's more. You can travel so many paths in your mind. You can become different people, live out different futures. And I think if I had to summarize it, I'd say that it's our ability to transcend the here and now and to sort of rise above whatever is literal and immediate. And it's that that sort of lets us partake of the potentially infinite experiences that you can have in this unbounded space and time. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so storytelling. And now our story, in a sense. Um, so Jeremy De Silva, he's an associate professor of anthropology at Dartmouth College. He is a paleoanthropologist specializing in the locomotion of the first apes, hominoids, and early human ancestors, hominins. OK, there is a difference there, OK? I did not know that, uh, but there is. His particular anatomical expertise, the human foot and ankle, has contributed to our understanding of the origins and evolution of upright walking in the human lineage. He has studied wild chimpanzees in West Uganda and early human fossils in museums throughout Eastern and South Africa. From 1998 to 2003, Jeremy worked as an educator at the Boston Museum of Science who actually is one of our partners, uh, and continues to be passionate about science education. 
In fact, he completed very recently one of these massive online courses that you can go. The platform is called EDX. So Dartmouth has a partnership with EDX, which produces all these online courses. I produced, I did one called Question Reality Exclamation Mark, which is about you, if you think this is real, you're kidding yourselves and, and, and why. Um, and uh, we have another one which is commissioned by the Institute uh, by a professor from Dartmouth uh, called Peter Tse, which is on free will. And it's coming out, I hope, in January. Um, and Jeremy did his one on, it's called Bipedalism X. They always put an X on some. So mine was Reality X, yours is Bipedalism X, right? But it's the science of upright walking. And since I'm a, a long uh, distance endurance runner, I'm very interested in bipedalism. So Jerry, please take the stage. Thank you. <laughs> so. It's a good thing I'm going to talk about bipedalism. Um, and I must admit, I was staring at feet and ankles while you guys were dancing around. <laughs> Fascinating motions <laughs> happening there. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. Uh, and Tasneem, David, thank you very much for participating in this. I'm looking forward to our discussion later. Um, what I, what I want to do uh, right now with you guys for the next 15, 20 minutes or so is uh, take you on a, a seven million year journey back to the origins of our lineage because uh, we're storytellers. And Tasneem is spot on here. We are trying to figure out where we come from and I have the great fortune of being able to uh, collect the evidence, the physical evidence we have that helps us reconstruct the path by which we became human. And it's really an extraordinary story that we've been able to tell about ourselves in the last 100 years or so. So I'll start in 1871. In 1871, Charles Darwin hypothesized that humans were most closely related to the African great apes. And he did this in The Descent of Man. This was almost 150 years ago. And he said, humans are most closely related to the African great apes. But he had almost no data to base this on. There were no fossils from the African continent yet discovered. And molecular genetics and DNA hadn't been discovered either. And yet he was right. He was absolutely spot on that humans are indeed most closely related to the African great apes, and in particular to chimpanzees, and an animal known as the bonobo, which wasn't even known during Darwin's time. It wasn't discovered by Western scientists until 1933. Now, since that time, we've spent a lot of our efforts comparing ourselves to our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. And we've noted all sorts of similarities we have with them, we share with them, and our differences. We, we move in a different way. We move on two legs rather than on all fours. And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, for the next 15 minutes or so. Our brains are larger, and with those brains, we've developed language and, and abstract thinking. Uh, we've developed technology, although some great discoveries by Jane Goodall have revealed that chimpanzees also use and modify tools as well. That was a big surprise. Um, let's see, we are, uh, we're the hairless ape, right, or the naked ape. We don't have as much body hair or body fur as a chimpanzee. We have more sweat glands than they have, which helps us run. We also have more subcutaneous body fat. So we should be careful of the things that we are talking about that differ between us and chimpanzees, some things maybe we're not so proud of. Uh, we also have bigger butts than they do. Um, there are all these wonderful similarities and differences between us and them. But one of the mistakes that we commonly ma make is assuming that we evolved from something like them, or even from them directly. Chimpanzees are not time machines. They're not our ancestors. They're our relatives. They live today. They're our cousins. And what Darwinian thinking has forced us to do is recognize that we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees that lived somewhere in the ballpark of about seven million years ago, presumably on the continent of Africa. Now, if this is true, if this is the case that humans and chimpanzees are closely related to each other, then there should be fossils that show us the path by which humans have evolved to what you see in the mirror every morning. These are called the missing links, right? But we have thousands of them. They're actually not missing. We've got lots and lots and lots and lots of these things. And I want to share uh, a couple of observations about them before we get rolling and, and, and talk about what we've learned from these fossils. The first is that every single one of these fossils tells a story. Bones tell stories. And every one of these fossils reveals something absolutely fascinating 
about our ancestry. So there was a, paper, a story that came out just this morning about Neanderthal teeth, isolated Neanderthal teeth, which allowed us to predict weaning times. When did moms wean their babies? And these are just fragmentary isolated teeth that they based that analysis on. So all of these fossils give us wonderful information about our past. The second thing is that we have thousands of fossils. And when I tell that to students, they get a little overwhelmed. In fact, there's an exam next week for those students who are out there um, uh, on these fossils. And people think, wow, thousands of fossils. But we're talking about time scales in the millions of years. And a million is a 1,000, 1,000. So even if I generously say we have 7,000 fossils, then we only have a fossil for every 1,000 years of existence. So if I borrowed Marcello's jaw, and that became the representative fossil for the last 1,000 years of human existence, we'd be missing a lot, right? So every time we find new fossils, it forces us to go back and reevaluate our old hypotheses, which is fun. That's how science works. When we get these new discoveries, we're terribly excited about it because we get to go back and reevaluate some of our old ideas. The third point that I want to make is that what I'm going to present to you is going to appear somewhat linear. Uh, however, what we've discovered in the last decade or two is that human evolution was much more complicated and frankly much more interesting than this linear story of a chimp slowly turning into a human that we see on t-shirts and coffee cups. Much more complicated than that. There were all sorts of different human experiments going on over the course of the last seven million years or so. But with that as sort of the ground rules, let's dive into the human fossil record. What we've learned through discoveries of just the last 15 years is this time period between four and seven million years ago, which we knew almost nothing about in the, in the 20th century, was occupied by an animal known as Artipithecus. They were found in Africa, and they were very ape-like in many respects. They had long curved fingers, they had long arms and short legs, very comfortable in the trees. They had a grasping big toe. They had chimpanzee-sized brains, but they were different from apes and more similar to you and I in two respects. Their canine teeth, their fang teeth, were like yours and mine. They were short and dull and blunt. And the other way in which they're human-like is their pelvis and aspects of their foot. And that suggests to us that they were able to come down out of the trees and walk around on two legs. So at the very base of our lineage, at the very start of this amazing human experiment, what differs between us and our closest living relatives are our smile and the way we walk. It really boils down to that. But by four million years ago, Artipithecus had evolved into a different animal on the African landscape we call Australopithecus, made famous by uh, this skeleton here. Who's that? Lucy, of course. Everyone knows Lucy. Lucy discovered in 1974 by Don Johansson in 3.2 million year old sediments in Ethiopia. And Lucy is an icon for our science. She's absolutely marvelous. But we have lots and lots and lots of other Lucys that we've discovered throughout Eastern and Southern Africa. Australopithecus had brains that were slightly larger than an Artipithecus, about 20% larger. And they had mastered bipedalism. They walked on two legs in much the same way that you and I do. Although we find different species of them scattered throughout Eastern and South Africa. And in their different microhabitats, they evolved slightly different ways of walking. There were different experiments in walking at this time. What's surprising to a lot of folks is that the oldest stone tool technology that we have actually goes back this far to the time of Australopithecus. Oftentimes, stone tools are thought to be associated with our own genus, the genus Homo, and the oldest ones we have now go back to the time of Lucy. So Australopithecus was the first stone tool maker. But by two million years ago, we begin to find a different kind of animal on the landscape that we associate with our own genus, the genus Homo. They evolve larger brains, more human-like teeth, they have more human-like body proportions in the sense that they have longer legs. And with those longer legs, they begin to expand their ranges, expand their ranges to the point that we find them outside of the African continent. For the first time in our lineage, we find early hominins in Europe and in Asia. They control fire, and fire is a game changer. Once you have fire, you don't have to sleep in the trees anymore. You can come down to the ground and sleep on the ground. And it's around these fires that I think we started with the storytelling for the first time. In Europe, these uh, members of genus Homo evolved into Neanderthals. And in Asia, they evolved into a group that's known mostly from their genetics, a group known as the Denisovans. But back home in Africa, by 300,000 years ago, they evolved into us. 
Homo sapiens. This is an African story. The lineage is African, the genus is African, the species is African. Homo sapiens is different from the predecessors in certain respects. We've got smaller faces than they had and more globular skulls, but not bigger ones. We tend to think we have the biggest brains, but Neanderthals had bigger brains than we had. Denisovans had bigger brains, most likely, than we had. And even Homo sapiens 30,000 years ago had bigger brains than you have today. Brains are getting smaller. They're not getting bigger. Think about that for a second. <laughs> Insert joke there, right? Um, but we are a, a creative species. We make stuff. We make art. Cave paintings. I have in here somewhere. I always have fossils with it. Let's see if I can find. Uh, nope. There we are. OK. Um, this is a small figurine discovered in Austria. It's about 30,000 years old. This is a replica. Um, and, and what a great example of what Tasneem was talking about earlier, where this is just a carving out of sandstone, but it's what it represents that makes this so human-like, right? This is probably a fertility symbol that was made by these folks 30,000 years ago. OK, so what I want to do now is take us back, though, to the very beginnings. Here is the big picture, right? But let's go back to that starting point. Seven million years ago, what got us rolling, what got us started on this remarkable human journey was the way we move. We move differently from other animals. You all walked into this room today probably not thinking much about how you move. But what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about is just how unusual upright walking actually is. Bipedalism is an incredibly strange way to move for a mammal. And mammals move in all sorts of fabulous ways. There are mammals that fly, mammals that swim, mammals that cling and leap, mammals that swing, mammals that sprint, mammals that knuckle walk and climb. There are mammals that hop, right? Those are bipeds, but we're talking about one stride at a time bipedalism. And then most mammals do what that cow does, right? Just move around on all fours, like a goat, sheep, horse, cow, dog, cat. That's the traditional way to move if you're a mammal, but not us. We move on our extended hind limbs, and it's weird. It's a strange way for a mammal to move. And to illustrate how strange it is, whenever people see another animal moving on two legs, right? we laugh. We videotape it. We post it to YouTube, and two and a half billion people watch it. This is a very watched video. Um, NBC News covered this. CNN covered this. This was a bear known as Petals that lived in the New Jersey suburbs and was walking around on two legs because it had an injured foreman. So when another mammal moves on two legs, it's news. Right? That's how unusual bipedalism actually is. And yet, we don't know why bipedalism evolved. If we're actually being honest with ourselves as scientists, we don't know why bipedalism evolved. But we can begin to explore the question by looking at some of its benefits. By moving on two legs, what were the benefits of this form of locomotion? Well, there are many scholars who have found that human bipedalism, moving on two legs, is energetically quite efficient. We use less fuel moving from point A to point B than other animals do. So if we all got up now and walked around Occam Pond and came back, walked maybe a mile or so, the number of calories that you would have burned could be replaced by a handful of raisins. Done. Okay, so we are so energetically efficient that we don't burn many calories when we walk from point A to point B. So that's one of our benefits of walking. But obviously, the big benefit of walking is freeing up these things, right? By liberating your limbs from the duties of locomotion, you can now do things with these hands. And sure enough, early on in the ancestry of Australopithecus, they're making stone tools. And probably prior to that, they're making other things as well. However, some of the other benefits to freeing up the hands have to do with carrying of our infants. When a chimpanzee has a baby, she puts it on her back, navigates through the forest, it clings to her while she's climbing. And one of the interesting observations that Jane Goodall and many other researchers have made about chimpanzees is that they do not let any other individuals in the group touch that kid. It is the mom and the baby for at least six months before she shares that baby with anyone else. It's very different in humans, right? 
if a human tried to put a baby on their back in the absence of a baby Bjorn, it'd slide right off, right? You have to actively carry your kid. And as kids became more and more helpless over the course of human evolution, this became a challenging task of carrying these kids around. So imagine you're Lucy, you're an Australopithecus, three million years ago, and you've got your baby, and you're looking up in a tree at a nice piece of fruit. You really want to get that piece of fruit. But climbing that tree with one arm would have been dangerous to you and to the kid. So what's the obvious thing to do? Well, hand the kid off to a helper, right? Go up, get your fruit. You're getting enough resources for yourself and for your baby as well. And then the baby comes back to you. But that requires cooperation. That requ requires trust. And I think we see that. We must have that early on in our lineage and our ancestors as, as we begin to cooperatively raise our kids. The whole idea that it takes a village to raise our kids probably has very deep evolutionary origins back to the beginnings of upright walking. What else we can carry is food. <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of food. <laughs> Freeing the arms allows us to do this, right? But if you have a surplus of food, as that wonderful chimpanzee is about to have, you're not going to eat it all. You can begin to share that food. Food sharing becomes an important part of this story as a result of our ability to collect more than we need. Now, Stanley Kubrick thought he knew why the hands were liberated. He came up with a hypothesis. Well, uh, he, he, he crystallized the idea in film of humans as the killer ape, that we were freeing our hands to use weaponry to, to uh, uh, kill other members of another group, maybe, uh, or to, to kill prey, to ambush prey. Now, this has a, a, a story to it, and I want to sort of uh, uh, share this. Um, and, and based primarily on, on what uh, Tasneem brought up with, with World War I. Um, during the war, there was a medic named Raymond Dart. And Raymond Dart was in those trenches and saw the results of the war uh, firsthand. And then he came back to South Africa. And in South Africa, he excavated a site called Makapansgat. This is in the 1940s. And where he found at that site were smashed animal bones, like this one. And he envisioned early human ancestors using these bones as weapons, using them to stab one another, using them to, to attack game. We were the killer ape. He published this idea in the early 1950s, and an author by the name of Robert Ardrey took hold of the idea and published a book in the 1960s called African Genesis. That book became a New York Times bestseller. That idea was co-opted at the beginning of the 2001 Space Odyssey film, The Dawn of Man Sequence. What made us human? was the freeing of the hands to use weapons, right? And who could blame these researchers and who could blame this interpretation of this post-World War I, post-World War II? However, in the 1970s, when researchers went back and examined these bones from Makapansgat, these bones weren't made by humans. They were chewed on by hyenas. <laughs> hyenas had broken the bones. So it was a misinterpretation of the data that led to this narrative of humans as the killer ape. And I want to turn that on its head and start talking about, for the, for the final piece of, 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 of uh, my presentation here, some of the costs of bipedalism. Because yes, there are benefits to it, but there are also enormous costs. So for instance, the fastest human being on the planet, fastest guy in the world, Bolt, right? Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt runs 28 miles an hour. 28 miles an hour. Whoa, right? That's half the speed of an antelope. Half the speed of a lion, half the speed of a leopard. And that's what should matter, right? He can't get away from a leopard. He couldn't catch a rabbit, a squirrel, or a chicken. <laughs> Humans, and he's the fastest one we've got, right? <laughs> Humans are exceptionally slow animals. By evolving bipedal walking and running, we have sacrificed the ability to gallop. We can't gallop. We've lost our speed. So without that speed, we're vulnerable out there in the landscape. Now, being perched up on two le legs rather than being on all fours, we were also incredibly unstable. <laughs> Humans fall all the time. You walk around the upper valley, right, wintertime, everyone's just going to do face plants. As they say. When's the last time you saw a squirrel just trip and fall, right? <laughs> Humans are slow, they're unstable, and we were predated upon. So at those same sites, 
where Raymond Dart was finding what he thought were the remains of kills we had made, researchers have more recently found the remains of early humans who had been killed by hyenas and leopards. This is the back of a skull of an early human ancestor, and it has two canine marks right through it. We were not the hunters. We were the hunted. So bipedalism makes us vulnerable. What I want to end with and sort of wrap this all up with is, is, is a story. Um, this is a fossil femur. It's an upper leg bone, a left upper leg bone, upper thigh, uh, that was discovered in Kenya in 1973 by a Kenyan paleontologist named uh, Bernard uh, in jail. And what Bernard noticed about this fossil was that it was most likely from an upright walking human ancestor. He could tell that because the head of the femur here, where the hip joint is, was offset considerably from the attachment for hip muscles, which would make them quite uh, mechanically efficient, give them leverage, so that every time you take a step, you can balance on a single leg. Only humans have this anatomy, so this was clearly from an early human. It was from an individual that had already reached full size, because there's no growth plate here. So it's not growing anymore, and at this size, it's, it's thought to be a, a, a female. So here we have a, a female, uh, probably around 80 or 90 pounds, a little bigger than Lucy. The volcanic ash around this fossil tells us that it, this individual lived about 2 million years ago, and it's presumably an Australopithecus. But what I want to draw your attention to is some unusual anatomy along the shaft here. There's a bulge in this shaft of the femur. There's a bulge right here, and there's a thickening of the cortical bone. And this is consistent with an individual today who experienced a spiral fracture of the femur. This is a healed fracture. This poor individual, maybe she fell out of a tree, maybe she was running and she stepped in a hole and turned that leg, but she shattered her femur. Two million years ago, there are no hospitals, there are no doctors, there's not even fire, there are no homes. She should have died. A leopard should have come and eaten her, but she didn't. She continued to survive. Other members of her group must have taken her and brought her to a tree, brought her up into a tree, and then for six weeks, it would take six weeks for this bone to heal. A bone pathologist came to my lab recently and looked at that bone and said, oh, she would have lived for years with this, that that callus shows that this happened years and years and years and years and years ago, that she continued to live even on this leg. And so I think the lesson here is that we can recognize bipedalism provides these wonderful benefits, right? of uh, freeing up of the hands, and it gives us all of these things that uh, we recognize as characteristics of, of being human, right? The freeing of the hands allows us to be creative, and it allows us to make our technology, and it allows us to do all the wonderful things that we do. But as bipeds, we also are incredibly vulnerable. And so what I think is important to recognize and end with is that by being a bipedal animal on this landscape so long ago, the only way we could have survived is this other wonderful thing we have as humans. We have care and compassion, empathy and prosociality. We take care of each other. We don't leave individuals for dead. And that separates us from many of the other animals out there. And I think that has very, very, very deep origins right to the beginning of our lineage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Okay, well, I, oh, sorry, I don't want to do justice. All right, so our last um, speaker is David Greenspoon, who is currently here at Dartmouth as an, an ice fellow. So he's, be, he's been visiting for a couple of months. He's staying until the end of November, all the way from Washington. So he's an astrobiologist. So for those of you who do not know what that means, it really means that it's okay now for scientists to think about extraterrestrial life. You actually get grants to do it. It's a wonderful <laughs> time. And, um, and he's an award-winning science communicator and a prize-winning author. His newest book is called Chasing New Horizons Inside the Epic First Mission to Pluto, co-authored with Alan Stern. He's a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute in Washington and an adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science at the University of Colorado. 
He's involved with several interplanetary spacecraft missions for NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. His book, Earth in Human Hands, Hands, the whole Earth, there you go, was named the best science book of 2016 by NPR Science Friday. His previous book, Lonely Planets, The Natural Philosophy of Alien Life, won the Penn Center USA Literary Award for Nonfiction. And I vouch for that book. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. So please, Dave, come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Um, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it's really an honor to um, share this event with such talented musicians and dancers and such um, interesting scholars. And uh, what uh, Tasneem said is right. Uh, we, we really need the uh, uh, perspective of all of these um, different viewpoints so we can get the, that sense of depth and uh, at least begin to address this, this question of what it means to be uh, human. Um, it, it does sound strange, doesn't it, that scientists are getting grants to uh, study extraterrestrial life now. But the way we do that um, is largely by studying Earth and its history and the way life has evolved with Earth and the, the limits, um, the uh, variety, um, and uh, the, the story of, of life. And then we study other environments in the universe and try to map those together to understand the potential for, uh, for life elsewhere. And that, in turn, illuminates a lot about our own planet and our own story. And so my particular take on this question of, um, of what it means to be human is to look at uh, the, how we, our species, fit into the story of our planet. I was a child of Apollo, um, grew up enthralled by the early space program, the first missions to Venus and Mars and other planets were happening when I was a kid. Uh, it captured my imagination and somehow that fascination, I managed to uh, parlay that into a career as a planetary scientist and an astrobiologist. So I've been fortunate to be a member of several teams of scientists and engineers who have uh, imagined and then built spacecraft that have uh, been sent to other planets and, um, and sent information back to us. And we get very attached to these, these spacecraft. They're, they're really, uh, in a way, like our children. We prepare them as best we can, uh, and then we send them off on their journeys, hoping they'll be OK, hoping they'll stay in touch. <laughs> And sometimes they don't. <laughs> but when they do, they send us back uh, information. Traveler's Tales is actually what Carl Sagan called his episode in Cosmos about planetary exploration, which I thought of when you talked about Traveler's Tales. Um, and, uh, and through this, we've developed what we call comparative planetology, where we use the similarities and the differences that we find to try to construct um, general understanding of how planets work, including how our own planet works. For instance, uh, these are, uh, and, and in particular, I love this trio, by the way, of worlds of Venus, Earth, and Mars, because uh, they, Venus and Mars are our two closest planets, both in physical proximity and also both in many ways the two most similar planets to Earth. And they have these, these divergent stories. Uh, here's an example of comparative planetology. These are river deltas on Venus, Earth, and Mars. And you can see the similarity in form. And yet they're all different in the details, and they tell us about the differences in the stories of these three worlds. In the case of Mars, it had rivers early on that uh, dried up. And so we see ancient river valleys and ancient river deltas, but they're billions of years old. In the case of Venus, there was a runaway greenhouse, and it became so hot and so dry that these rivers were carved by lava, and yet they follow that same form. In the case of Earth, you can see that uh, even from the orbital scale, the influence of life in this river delta 
uh, that has a complex interplay of the geological and the biological. So these planets, it turns out, started out with very similar conditions when they were all young. And yet they all went off in radical directions. Both Venus and Mars experienced climate catastrophes when they were young. Mars froze over. Venus had a runaway greenhouse. And Earth went through a different kind of radical change. Earth came to life and went down a path very different from that of its neighbors, sort of a branching point where life formed and then sort of took over or, or, or uh, permeated the entire planet. And then I'm going to fast forward the story here because we only have um, 20 minutes or so for my segment, and it's a four and a half billion year story, so that's quite a compression ratio. <laughs> but then much more recently, something else happened to Earth, something very strange. The appearance of uh, what we um, sometimes call civilization, although that word is very fraught. And we find that, in fact, many of the words we use to try to describe ourselves are fraught. But certainly, a transition and, and another kind of transition on this planet. And as an astrobiologist, I'm driven to wonder if these are transitions of a kind that occur elsewhere in the universe. If you were an alien astrobiologist watching our planet, an alien astrobiologist with a really long attention span so that you were watching our world in time lapse over four and a half billion years. And by the way, on that time scale, your seven billion years is really tiny, a fraction of 1%. So that's a, that's a short story in this novel. <laughs> um, but if you were an alien astrobiologist watching our planet over the eons, you certainly would have seen a lot of changes. The, uh, the plates, uh, the tectonic plates shifting around the continents, merging into supercontinents and splitting apart and morphing around in this sort of spherical jigsaw puzzle that shifts. You would have seen the climate change and oscillate between a greenhouse, hothouse, and, and, and ice ages. So you'd see the polar caps growing and shrinking sort of quasi-rhythmically over time doing, doing their dance. Um, and, Throughout all those changes, all those billions of years, though, the night side of the planet would have been nearly an unbroken blackness with the occasional flash of lightning or splash of aurora. And then recently, uh, only 400 million years ago, you would have started to see forest fires as the continents became greened, but mostly just an unbroken blackness until very recently, just a, a blink of an eye in this story, whoa, what is this? And the night side lights up in this strange pattern, starting in a few coastal areas and then spreading on these, these nodal lines across the continents with, with a pattern that seems sort of organic, but, but with some other new quality as well. And then shortly thereafter, a raft of other changes on the planet you would have observed, changes in the atmosphere, changes in the composition of the ocean, the geometry of the patterns on the land, perturbations to all the chemical cycles, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, these strange linear waves crossing the oceans and then strange linear clouds streaking through the atmosphere. And then very recently, in just the last twitch of time, the last 70 years, which is really short in this fast forward view, something else really kind of unusual and unprecedented, little bits of the planet leaping back off into space. Uh, little insect-like contraptions buzzing around nearby space and then some of them buzzing off to other worlds and sending radio signals back. And if you were this alien astrobiologist and had been watching all of this, you would certainly notice something new is happening on this planet, something unprecedented, unprecedented that has never happened before. A new force has awakened here. What is that? Well. You've probably heard this word Anthropocene, or Anthropocene, or as our British colleagues say, Anthropocene. But I'm not here to argue over how to pronounce it. We can do that afterwards. But uh, it's, the idea, of course, is that we've entered a new 
epoch of Earth history defined by this new force, the combined forces of, of humanity, which uh, the combined activities of humanity, which if you look at the numbers, it's indisputable that is now as great or greater in effect than the forces of change we've traditionally considered to be geological forces. Uh, and, and this is just a picture I took out of um, airplane window recently showing this, this new kind of geometry that is uh, the, the, the squares and circles that are uh, abutting here, this older kind of fractal geometry of nature. Uh, there, there, there are many ways to describe this, but um, I'm very interested in the question as a planetary scientist of what this really represents in terms of the history of the planet. What's really new and different about this? After all, we are not the first species to come along and change the planet radically. We're not even the first species to come along and in the quest for a new energy source, pollute the atmosphere so much that it causes a disaster and causes mass extinction of other species and causes a climate catastrophe. That's been done before. In fact, these little guys did it. These cyanobacteria, they look innocent enough, don't they? But two and a half billion years ago, they discovered this new energy force, new energy source of energy called solar energy. These guys perfected photosynthesis, and they exploited it so fully that they polluted the atmosphere with a dangerous gas. That gas was O2, oxygen, which at that time led to mass extinction. Now, of course, we've evolved to use those powerful reactions of oxygen with organic matter that were deadly when oxygen first appeared. That's how we power ourselves. That's respiration, but that's what evolution does. It's opportunistic. But at the time, it was a disaster. Um, so when you hear this, do you say to yourself, you know, how could they, those irresponsible cyanobacteria? They were not good planetary citizens. But, you know, because uh, we, we don't say that because they're just bacteria, right? And yet today, now, we see ourselves behaving in a somewhat analogous fashion. And those of us that are paying attention and have a soul <laughs> say, wow, that's horrible. You know, that's horribly irresponsible. What are we doing? And so then this causes me to ask, what's really the difference? You know, what have we got that the cyanobacteria didn't have? Which is really kind of another way of asking this question, you know, this fraught question of human exceptionalism. What makes us different? If we're going to name a geological age after ourselves, is that just an exercise in self-aggrandizement? Is that just arrogant? Um, or is there really something new going on here in the planet? And I think this question of the difference between the cyanobacteria and their planet-destroying role and our planet changing, um, I think that can help us get at the answer. There are many ways in which our planet has changed. If you look at the whole history, the many sources of catastrophe. There, have been, there are random things like asteroids that hit the planet or volcanic uh, eruptions that cause mass extinctions. Even the life itself, as in the case of the cyanobacteria and several other times, just evolution of life has led to the success of some forms of life that have caused disaster for other forms of life. So we are not the first agents of planetary change. And yet, I think that word agent or agency carries a clue as to what's really different here. In my view, what's really new about the Anthropocene about this transition that's happening to the Earth now is the role of cognitive processes. That somehow now cognitive processes have become planetary processes. Our mental, this abstract thought, our ability to project um, ourselves to, to uh, form culture, but then also to, to uh, use technology to increase our reach and start to change our environment. That's ultimately an outgrowth of our, our cognitive skills. Um, and somehow now they've, the, the, the power of that cognitive activity has grown and increased to the point where it's become a planetary process. But I also think there are two different forms that takes, that it has taken, that it can take. And I think the, the distinction between them is very important. Um, I will call them inadvertent planetary changes and intentional 
planetary changes. So when I, what I mean by in, inadvertent planetary catastrophe or planetary change is represented by this picture of traffic. And again, I think that the question of agency is very important, the scale of agency, because here in this picture, each one of these cars is driven by a person with agency. We're very good at that. If you think about it, it's amazing how well traffic works, that we're not always hitting each other, that uh, we can avoid obstacles and hit the brakes even unconsciously when we need to and steer. Uh, so here's an example of a species that's really good at solving local survival problems and using technology to extend its ability to do so, but in so doing has inadvertently created a global change that they've sort of stumbled into because you can see the agency in each of these drivers, but yet if you look at the whole system and if you look at the global transportation system, you can ask, so who's driving that? And the answer is kind of, well, nobody. So it's an example of how we, we participate in these systems on a larger scale that we have no sense of agency. It's almost like um, you know, a, a dream where you find yourself doing something, but you don't have any sense of control over that if we look at ourselves on this larger scale. And that's what I call the Anthropocene dilemma, where our, uh, our influence exceeds our sense of agency or our sense of control. So the scale of control here is small. It's the size of the cars, and yet there's an activity going on with the whole traffic pattern and the whole global transportation system. Um, so an example of that inadvertent kind of planetary change, obviously the one that we're all most aware of now, represented here by the Keeling curve, the, the steady oscillating increase of carbon dioxide over the years. And you're very familiar with this and all of the effects. So I won't spend a lot of time on this now, but one of these effects, of course, is the um, frightening decrease in sea ice, in the, in the polar sea ice. And this is obviously the most pressing example right now of one of these inadvertent global uh, changes. It was inadvertent when we started uh, using uh, fossil fuels and using uh, internal combustion engines. Nobody said, hey, let's change the planet. We were um, finding really good solutions to local problems. But the global scale activity leads to unintended consequences. Another example of one of these inadvertent changes is um, the ozone hole. And you've heard about this as well, um, which, by the way, was uh, first discovered in part because we were studying the planet Venus. And uh, some scientists noticed uh, some puzzling lack of oxygen in the upper atmosphere of Venus and figured out that chlorine destroys Venus. And some other scientists read that paper and said, oh, that's interesting. What about all this chlorine we're putting up in the stratosphere with these, uh, these refrigerants, these CFCs? And they said, uh-oh, wait a minute, and put two and two together. Um, and it gets deeper throughout the 70s and the 80s. But then, interestingly, it sort of levels off by the year 2000. And that leveling off is a really interesting phenomenon that I use as an example of the other kind of cognitively driven planetary change that I will call intentional planetary change. Because what happened with the ozone was we saw what we were doing. Some scientists sounded the alarm. It wasn't immediate. There was a big argument. People said it was a hoax. People were defending their economic interest. A lot of what's going on now with the, the, the fossil fuel issue. And yet, uh, the truth became overwhelmingly apparent. And even eventually, the DuPont company got on board and said, OK, we've got to create replacements and phase these out. Of course, before they did that, DuPont patented the, um, you know, the replacement chemicals. So there was not, it was not all selfless. Nonetheless, it's an example of where a problem was recognized. There was a global conversation about this. Global action was undertaken. And indeed, the ozone layer is being fixed. It's on track to being fixed. It takes 50 years for the chemical reactions to bring it back, even if you stop the dangerous behavior. So we've got to stay on task. And there's some wrinkles in that story you may know of, but the overall story is, is one of success. And so this is a proof of concept, I think an important proof of concept, that we have it within us. We have within us the capacity to interact in a different way with global scale problems. 
It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, that, oh, no problem, we got this. There are many ways in which this is a much easier problem to solve. Um, certainly the economics of it are easier than um, the, the fossil fuel problem, which is, is so deeply embedded in um, uh, our, our economy and some, some massive um, economic interest. But nonetheless, it serves as a proof of concept of a different way of interacting with planetary scale problems. Now, other examples of intentional planetary changes, and I'll give you just a few, but the most important one, of course, is our ongoing effort to change our energy sources so that they do not destroy the natural systems on which we depend. And this is an effort which is underway. And obviously, it's too little too late to avoid damage. There's going to be damage. And yet, it's also true there's a global conversation going on about this that was not happening 20 years ago. And that there are a lot of signs moving in the right direction, solar energy getting cheaper, a lot of powerful interests getting on board with this. It's not. We're all, or I think many of us here, most of us, are painfully aware that it's, this transition is happening uh, in, in a painfully slow motion fashion. And it's complicated, and there are counter reactions. And you know, we, we could spend hours talking about just that. But it is an example of what, what I call a, a global change of the fourth kind, an intentional planetary change, which is um, underway now. Uh, and, and in my view, we will get through it. 100 years from now, we won't be using fossil fuels. We'll have made the transition far too slowly. We'll look back and say, look at all the damage we did. Look at all the pain and displacement. Uh, how could we have been so stupid? And yet, we will uh, move through this to another time. Uh, looking farther into the future, there are other kinds of threats that we can apply intentional planetary changes to meet. Uh, on longer time scales, Earth has been hit in the past by asteroids and comets. It will be again. These can cause mass extinctions, except it doesn't have to be, because now we uh, have in place an observation program. We're identifying these objects, and we actually know how to stop them, or we think we do. Um, and so it may be that a more positive way of looking at the Anthropocene, if we can get over this difficult century we have in front of us is that this may be the time when Earth no longer is threatened with extinction by some, uh, by some forces that have plagued our planet throughout its history. Um, on even longer time scales, there's the possibility of the inevitability, actually, of dangerous natural climate change. We have this illusion that left to its own devices, the Earth is a paradise, and we just have to take our hands off and everything will be fine. That is an illusion born of the fact that our um, current civilizations have grown up in this 10,000 year period of relatively warm and stable climate that is actually an aberration in planetary history. If we wait long enough, there will be another ice age. We wouldn't survive it. A lot of other species wouldn't either. And it's an interesting question. If we know about these longer term threats and we can conceive of how to mitigate them, then do we have a responsibility to do so? And even though we're talking really long time scales now, I think it's part of a transition into realizing that we are a geological force, thinking of, a geological, think of, our, thinking of ourselves as a geological process, realizing we're embedded in the history of the Earth, and be, becoming more conscious of our role. And that, uh, in addition to our immediate responsibility of ceasing our vandalism of the climate, I think inevitably leads us to think of these longer term responsibilities and ponder what role we will ultimately want to play on the planet. And when I think of the long term future, I can't help but think of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Because people that do SETI have long been aware of the fact that when you do the math of SETI and you ask the question, is there anybody else out there? And what are their stories? <laughs> and, and, and what stories might they be able to tell us someday? Um, the answer is tied to the longevity of civilizations. If all civilizations that discover powerful technology flare out after a few hundred years because they just can't handle that responsibility, then there's going to be nobody out there to talk to. You can actually show this mathematically. 
If, on the other hand, some, and it, can only be, it could even be just a small fraction, figure it out, get a handle on themselves, figure out how to use powerful technology as a tool for survival as opposed to a threat for, to survival and last for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years even, then the math shows that the galaxy should be much more populated with um, conversants, people, uh, not people, but um, sentient creatures we could discover and maybe even communicate with someday. So, the, so then, it's interesting because then the, the exercise of SETI takes on this sort of hopeful t um, aspect that w what we're searching for are the survivors. If we hear from someone or discover someone, it means it's possible to get through this little bottleneck we're in now of uh, what has been called technological adolescence. And it's possible to achieve great longevity. The truly intelligent species will have great longevity. Are we truly intelligent? We don't know. In fact, our alien astrobiologist I mentioned at the beginning, she's uh, not sure. She's withholding judgment on the human race. She's got a long attention span. She's going to wait and see about us. But it's very clear that if we do want to survive and be one of those long-lived civilizations, we're going to have to change our relationship with the planet and have that intentional, conscious mode of interacting with the planet come to dominate over the inadvertent, uh, random mode of interacting with the planet. If we want to create what I call Terra Sapiens, which is a world in which we've learned to integrate gracefully our activities with the natural cycles of the planet, then we have to become a new kind of entity on this planet. We need to learn to live comfortably over the long haul with world-changing technology. We need to use our knowledge of the way the Earth works and our newfound awareness of our own influence to gracefully interact with the great cycles of planet Earth. We have to learn to work, work with the Earth not against it. And the key right now, or one key, is the propagation of a worldview that is global and multi-generational. Um, one thing that this exercise in thinking about the Anthropocene as an astrobiologist has made me feel is that we need to have a little more sympathy for ourselves. We're trying to do something that n has never been attempted before. And one hears these days a lot of anti-humanism in the responses to the Anthropocene, like, oh, people suck, and can't we just exterminate all the humans and the Earth would be fine? You know, I don't actually want to exterminate all the humans. I like art and dance and music and scholarship and all, all these things. But you know, we've got some problems, clearly, and some challenges, and some, you know, we've got to grow up in a hurry. But think about the metaphors we use to talk about ourselves. A lot of times, we're a cancer. We're a virus. We're criminals on the earth. We're raping the rainforest. And you know, there's a truth to these metaphors, a horrible truth, yet they're not the whole story. Because a virus doesn't stop and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be a virus. You know, and have conversations about it. So there's something else going on here. So one thing I'm interested in is, is considering and promoting some other kinds of metaphors. The metaphor of, of childhood. You know, we're like an infant first looking at her hands and trying to figure it out, saying, oh, I have agency in this world. I, I'm, I have power, but I don't know what I'm doing here. Or uh, the, the metaphor of the unschooled driver. You know, you're, you're, you, you wake up and you're, you're driving down a road and, and there's a bit, you're driving a big rig, and, and you don't, but you don't know how to drive. And everything and everybody you love is in the back, so you better learn how to drive in a hurry. That's kind of us on the earth realizing that we have this global agency, but we don't have a survival manual. We don't have the story. We need, we need it, <laughs> but, we, but we don't have it. Or, or I think I mentioned the, the sleepwalker. You wake up in the middle of committing this horrible crime, and, you know, but now you have to take responsibility and deal with it. So anyways, I, I, I um, have sympathy for the human race, and I, I want to encourage that, that we see ourselves as immature and, and confused, not uh, constitutionally evil. Um, so finally, I want to wrap up, but I'll just say, what makes us human? What are we? Well, from a planetary history perspective, we are the species that can change the world and realize that that's what we are doing. And then the question is, what are we going to do with that knowledge? Can we integrate it in a conscious way and change our behavior in such a way that we can become 
well integrated in a positive, constructive way with the planet. Um, and that then is the, I believe, the uh, framing of our challenge that comes out of thinking of our role in planetary history. So thank you very much. <laughs> So now what we do is we very quickly, I know it's, it's a long time, so if you want to stand up and stretch your legs, that's OK. Um, and what we'll do is we'll quickly transition to a panel mode. It will be short because I don't want it to go too long, and also because I know you may have questions for, for the panelists as well. Um, but we'll do this as quickly as we can, I guess. And then, just to entice you, there'll be a reception outside. Only the people that stay until the end can eat. <laughs> so that's the only, the only paycheck. So let's do this. Come on, let's, uh, please, yeah, just us? join us, yeah. <clears throat> OK, so I hope, um, I hope you're all inspired by what you've heard today. You know, it was. Uh, very different perspectives on the single topic of us, which is always a nice thing, right? I mean, we want to know always who we are and what we're here for and what's, what's, uh, what gives us meaning in life. Um, and the way this usually works is that I um, ask a couple of questions to the panelists. And then if they have questions that they want to ask to one another, they'll be excellent as well. Um, and then we open to Q&A from you, OK? So um, one thing that occurred to me, you know, trying to kind of bring it all together, you know, so Tasneem, you mentioned that, and that was a beautiful view, that children, you know, look at a box, and they see the box, but they also see the house, mm -hmm. and they can live with that superposition of images, right, and, and can have fun doing that. Um, Grown-ups, they seem to lose that a little bit because, you know, when we look at a forest, you know, and here we are in New Hampshire, Vermont, lots of forests around us, you know, we can think of it as, let's go forest baiting, right? Let's go into the forest and replenish ourselves and be one with nature, et cetera. But then we can also think, ooh, timber, <laughs> right? And usually these two groups, these two interests tend, tend to kind of go a little bit against one another. And, and so we are storytellers, but sometimes we look at the same thing and we tell very different stories. And I think the way we evolved, you know, and I don't know that uh, if from an anthropological perspective, if you look at different cave paintings from different times, you kind of know a little bit about the culture of that particular group and how it depicted perhaps the animals or the, where they're living in different ways. But the thing is that a lot of what we do is contingent to the tribe we belong to, or to the group of interests we belong to. And I think the, the, the earth issue, which is really the big issue here, right? Because it's not just our issue, it's an issue for the future generations, is one that, as, as Dave said, needs a different story. Now, how are we going to do that? You know, I mean, what is it going to take to kind of go beyond the tribal walls that we have that make us the superposition really hard to sustain you know, on a fragile planet. Because now the planet is fragile in a sense, right? Because there's only so much abuse it can take from us. So what, what would it take to look at the science, to look at the storytelling, and to think that we need a different kind of myth for our age, a unifying myth that goes beyond you know, tribal divisions and is really a story of our species as a whole? That's a tough question, I know, but still. <laughs> I mean, well, uh, you know, uh, Carl Sagan used to talk about uh, identification horizons, how, um, you know, uh, you can go from just thinking about your family to thinking about your, your village and, or your tribe and then your country. And then he, he used to talk about the goal of, you know, expanding our identification horizon to, to the whole world. And, and there's this fantasy that's um, been in a lot of science fiction or just uh, thought experiments that, what if we uh, did become aware, actually, of an extraterrestrial uh, civilization? Not, not it was necessarily threatening us, although that could be the story. That is the story in a lot of science fiction. But, but would, would that um, sort of congeal this global mm -hmm. identity? But you know, I had a dialogue recently with a, with a religious ethicist um, 
uh, from the group at Princeton, um, the Center for Theological Inquiry, who put a little bit of a damper on my idea that oh, all we need is this, this global view, because he said, well, what about like ExxonMobil? They have a global view, um, and they want to globally, you know, they see timber, not the forest, right? And so that got me thinking that the identification horizon needs to be not just in space, but in time. Because if you are thinking of future generations and of this long-term presence on the planet, then you're much less likely to think, oh, let's just chop down that forest because it's timber because you, you're going to be concerned with it. So, so maybe we need to expand our awareness in you know, four dimensions, not just three. I also think it's interesting that um, I mean, we've traditionally, are, like you said, our horizons have grown. You know, when we, uh, long ago, before travel was very um, frequent, people had tribes, people had smaller villages, whatever was known to them, right? And one of the things I think that's happening with frequent travel is that a lot of us identify as multiple things at the same time, right? So we're kind of doing, I mean, I belong to this culture, but I went to school in this country, and now, you know, I love this about so and so, so there's like a, a lot of that going on now. I think people are developing this more sort of nuanced sense of identity and the fact that you can have more than one loyalty. And I think in, to some extent, all of us are trying to resolve that within ourselves. So um, I think that the conflict, you know, initially it was just, well, if you're not off me, then you are against me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is something that's playing out in, in all of our lives on an individual level. We're realizing that we, you know, belong to different uh, traditions, different cultures simultaneously. Um, so I think that is one thing that could help. The other thing I just wanted to say, I loved both your presentations, by the way. It was like all of these ideas running through my head and I was looking for paper and pencils, like I need to write this down. Um, but what Jerry said, I mean, completely changed my view and just, just sort of sitting there in, in 15 minutes because the story he told was so different to what I had envisioned. I mean, just towards the end, that twist that you had about and it just took that one thing, right? That one bone, that one interpretation about how we can be like these caring, collaborative creatures and how that is something, I think it's important to realize that we've always been that way. Like that, yes. that's part of us, right? So to have that, that sort of long term view, I think a, a sense of history also helps. You sort of go back to, well, this is who we've always been. We just have to come back to ourselves. And you know, we need to sort of, um, there are ways of coming together that don't have to do with external threats. It's just that, you know, our families are, are growing and now this whole planet is, is our family and we've always looked after our own. Um, but I, I do think we need more stories and, and more metaphors um, that, you know, that help change your perspective because a story can do that in 10 minutes. It, it did for me. Suddenly I was like, oh, we're so nice. <laughs> we're so sweet. <laughs> I, I think you're, you're spot on there. Um, and uh, certainly as, as the world becomes more connected, um, being able to talk to, to colleagues around the world that quickly mm -hmm. and share ideas, and I see it in my students, that they're more connected with each other around the world than, than I was as a student. Mm -hmm. It gives me tremendous hope. Um, I suppose the cautionary tale for me as I look at, at, the, at the past and, and look at our successes as a lineage um, generally what we see is that Homo erectus is the lineage that really takes off and does well and, and travels around the globe and goes to Asia and Europe and Africa and begins to live in different habitats. And um, for a long time we were a species that was, uh, or a lineage at least, that was limited to um, certain places and eating certain things. And Homo erectus became this ultimate generalist. And that's what led to our, our survival. We would have gone extinct if they had been too specialized. Animals that are too specialized, eventually uh, environmental change pulls the rug out from their, their specialized adaptations and they go extinct. So these beautiful, marvelously adapted animals usually end up going extinct. Uh, and we see it happening right now with, with some, you know, something as, as magnificent as a polar bear. Beautifully adapted for its environment, mm -hmm. but look what happens when the environment changes on it. And so throughout the history of um, apes, uh, apes used to be more plentiful. Uh, there, there are times in our past, 12, 15 million years ago, when there were dozens of species of ape that we have in the fossil record. And now they're just a few. And they were decreasing in number long before we had anything to do with it. Apes are very specialized. They're too specialized. And we are an ape, a bipedal ape that then became a generalist. And as a generalist, we can live anywhere, eat anything, survive anything. 
And a lot of that has to do with our culture and our innovation, but it means we have become incredibly good at extracting resources out of our environment. And I look back in the past and say, wow, look at Homo erectus extracting resources out of its environment. What an amazing ancestor of ours. And then it's, uh-oh, because that's what we inherited, right? is this ten tendency to strip resources from an environment. And so making these decisions to treat the world differently um, is going against millions of years of, of our, our biological tendencies, right? And that's gonna take a real, uh, it's gonna take self-reflection and it's gonna take um, a, a conscious effort on our part because it's not gonna be easy. You know, if this was easy, the environmental, environmentalist movement of the 1970s would have changed everything and it, and it hasn't. So this is gonna be hard. Yeah, but it's but it's doable. I think it's doable, but it's but it's hard. It has to become at the, at the level of individual agency. I'm convinced that it's only going to happen when each person takes responsibility for his and her life and acts accordingly, and then talks to the family, talks to the communities, talks to the school, and it's really going to be a, a grassroots thing, you know. Because if you expect a top-down change of order, it's just not going to happen. So I think it really is up to us to kind of the cliche, be the change you want to see happening in the world kind of thing, you know, and it starts with, with it really at the individual. So that's the thing with collective intelligence, right? You have a phase transition, like different individuals start to act in certain ways and together make a huge change that, sh that really transforms ice into water and vice, you know, and other things in physics. And, now, and there, there, there are examples from, from our history uh, of, of those kinds of phase changes. And that, that I think they're, uh, what you just said, Jerry, is very, very sobering. Um, and there's definitely some tr truth to it. Um, but, the, but there are also examples of, of uh, radical reinvention in our long-term evolutionary history, as well as um, changes in consciousness, things that, that behaviors that we all thought were okay, that then um, the mass consciousness changes and, and they're no longer okay. Uh, and the, that's the level of change that, that we need to uh, promote and uh, um, seek now. Yeah. Now, folks, it's 6.30. Uh, so in the interest of time, this could go on for a long, but uh, we want to hear you too. So we do have a microphone that will circulate. If you have questions to any one of us, please uh, raise your arm and Amy is going to move around and <laughs> there'll be a few questions and I think we can, is 15 minutes okay with you? Yeah. I just, can you hear me? I just, I just have a question about your audience. No offense to any of you in here, but we're kind of, you know, on uh, a certain age level. Are That's you, right. is ICE speaking to young people and, um, you know, high schools? Uh, I mean, this is, you make, bones and everything, very exciting, and telling stories you're going to capture kids. Um, we're, we're, on, we're on our way out, you know? <laughs> well, so how can we get young people, you know, yeah. do a hip-hop or Lin-Manuel, uh, you know, Miranda up here or something like that? That's a very, I don't know, just how do you, uh, you know, the question. dance and getting arts back in schools and, you know, mm -hmm. the whole, I don't know. Yeah, that's, don't a, that's an excellent question, actually. And uh, I have to say that um, um, I've been a professor here for a very long time, and it's been historically very difficult to attract students to events like this. It's not just us, it's pretty much everybody. Because they're kind of overwhelmed with what they do, and when they do have some time off, they don't want to go and sit and listen to another lecture unless it's a superstar person that speaks directly to them, you know. Uh, and for that, we need a very big grant indeed, you know, to bring them over here. <laughs> However, let me say that when we go out into the world, so when we do events at the 92nd Street Y in New York, or the Chicago Ideas Festival, or in San Francisco the audience is much, much younger. So it's really, and, and, and I actually we did one other event at another university at Arizona State uh, on, on the meaning of time, and you could see that there too. You would expect more students, right? It turns out that it's in the theaters where you see the younger people. So not always lost, 
but, uh, but, and I think, David, you know, we do a lot of public understanding of science, and there is a way of, say, hitting the young, so to speak, which I think we both do, and, and, and uh, which, which works out quite well. The, the um, demographics of your MOOC, if you look at the age groups, I bet they're younger. At least we in my had, case. We had a three-year-old, <laughs> so I know. <laughs> I don't know what they took from it, but. Um, so so it, yeah. there are different ways. It's usually related to media, social media, you know, and stuff like that. For example, I started giving free lectures on my YouTube channel, you know, and they're all young, mostly, you know, and, and so that's perhaps different ways of doing it. But you're right, it is hard. But well, we're not If I can just make a quick, quick <laughs> comment, when I go around and give talks at, at museums and places where there is a more multi-generational audience, um, I'm very encouraged by the young people in this country and the way that they are hip to these ideas and these concerns. And obviously, we need to keep educating, keep talking to them. But, but strangely, right now, it's the older people I'm worried about and the way they're voting. And the way they're, uh, you know, I, I was talking to a, a friend of mine earlier today who's an environmental activist, and we were saying, God, you know, if we could just keep the world together and hand it off to these kids, you know, they're like, <laughs> they're, they're, they're conscious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one, yes? Yes, I have a question. Since, since you are all, sci well, you're all scientists, it is my contention that if we make it easy, for each one of us to do the right thing, we will succeed at this. Are you working on making it easier for people? I mean, you don't have to make it easier for me because I'm already doing everything I can possibly do. But there are a lot of people out there that only do things that are easy. So I just like your feedback on the easy quotient in our future. What, how does that work into the betterment of our world? Um, what, how do you define easy? Cheap? I, I'll, I'll dive in. Um, that's a tough question. I, so I don't, I don't think it's going to necessarily be easy, but I hear what you're saying. Um, and I think it's going to start with, with equity and equal opportunity. That if you have populations of, of, of folks who are just barely surviving, I mean, I see this when I travel to Africa, that um, there's a lot of, um, of exploitation of forest resources and the production of charcoal out of these forest resources. And that is, um, changing the habitats where the chimpanzees are living and, and, and uh, resulting in, in the depletion of their numbers dramatically. And yet, the people there um, need to eat, right? And they're gonna do what's in their own best interests rather than thinking of something globally uh, at, that, at that moment. And I don't blame them. I'd be making the same decision if it was my family as well. And so I think it's gonna start with, um, with, with equity and equal opportunity around the globe. Um, and that's when folks can start to make those kinds of decisions because they have the luxury to do so. Yeah, I mean, that would be my response, but. I well, I, I, I think that's, that's a great point, Jerry. And another um, example is, um, you know, it's been said um, wisely, I think, uh, recently by a few people that, you know, if you, if you really want to um, fight climate change and overpopulation globally, then contribute to the education of girls in poor countries. Um, because that, uh, you empower girls, you empower women to make reproductive choices and other choices, and uh, population growth goes down because people are not just desperate and they're making more conscious choices. And again, it's another example of, you know, nobody wants to destroy the world, but people are going to do what they need to do or what they feel they need to do to survive. So if you create those conditions, where uh, there's not a conflict between those two. Uh, and there, there are 
ways we know of that we can do. And, 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 and there's, you know, some of the news is good. I mean, you know, the, the population projections later in this century are, um, they all show it uh, population peaking and then, and then starting to turn over. It peaks at, you know, 10 billion people is a little frightening, but, they, but it turns over for the right reason, not because of an increase in the, in the death rate, but because of a decrease in, in the birth rate, because poverty, is, extreme poverty is declining. And so there are some of these trends that we can, uh, you know, the wind's blowing in the right direction that we can, you know, try to um, uh, accentuate. Or, you know, just play devil's advocate, you know, you could think like JFK, you know, we are going to the moon and do all these other things because it is hard. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and honestly, at the level of individual agency, to change your life habits because you have a purpose which is bigger than what you need immediately is really hard, you know, and it takes, as you said, it takes being able to do it, you know, and, and having the moral latitude to actually make that choice. And that's not always very easy. It's actually super hard, you know, and, um, and we know this. And we could go on for a long time about this, but I won't um, because we have other questions. Uh, but but that, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, this seems kind of central to the topic at hand. Do you think human nature or do you think humans are still evolving or has human nature reached a point where it's become static? So not evolving from a biological person, but from a human. I'm asking, is it still evolving from a biological genetic well, I think point that Can I? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Let's do it. Love this question. <laughs> um, so uh, there, there's, there, many folks have argued that once humans became a, a cultural animal that we overcame, that we had this cultural buffer on uh, natural selection, and, we, and we, we, we are no longer biologically evolving. Um, and that that would have gone back into the Upper Paleolithic, you're talking about 50,000 years ago. Um, but geneticists have found that there are all these major changes that have happened in the human population in just the last 10,000 years. Um, changes having to do with eye coloration, increase in the number of individuals with blue eyes, changes in the number of genes you have for digesting starches, which would have been really beneficial with the advent of agriculture. Um, Changes, uh, we can measure the changes in the frequency of individuals who are born without a third molar. And so since, for 35 million years, our lineage, going back to the common ancestor with monkeys, had three molars. Three, uh, you know, a, a, a wisdom tooth was part of our dental arcade, and we're beginning to lose it. And it's happening in part because um, not everyone on the planet has access to dental care. And so we look at that and we say, oh, you know, it's a toothache. Well, in some places, that tooth infection kills the person. And so when you have that many people on the planet still without access to health care and without access to dental care, then, um, then of course they're still subject, subject to natural selection. And so large swaths of the population are still under the, 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 the influence of natural selection in populations uh, in terms of the, the human species, we're, we're still changing, we're still evolving. But just, can I be contrarian for a sure. second and yeah. say that I feel like the examples you gave of yes, uh, in a way, are a resounding no. And that, and that none of them are examples of evolving um, in any sense that is going to change our ability to face the problems that we, um, that we are facing, and in that sense, I mean, it's interesting. Sure. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's not, yeah, we yeah, are yeah. changing genetically, and so it's false that you know the statement that we're not. But in terms of uh, the people that say it's been outstripped by cultural change and technological change, I mean, in terms of our actual manifestation as a species on the planet, it's hard to argue that changes in our teeth and our ability to you know digest starch is really going to affect our ability to survive at this point. And it's hard to predict, right? You know, this the starch duplication, the duplication of the starch genes, um, we couldn't have predicted, and yet. Looking back on it, the advent of agriculture is what was the, the, the cause of that, right? So the next century, the next two centuries, the changes we're going to face on this planet, those new selection pressures on people, what that's going to do uh, with, this, the, the, with the variation that we see with the 7.5 billion people, there's now more variation than ever. And that's the raw material natural selection works on. Um, and so the ingredients are there. We just can't predict what's going to result. There is a completely different dimension to your question, though, which is that we are changing big time because of our connection with technology. Yeah. And, 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 and in a very short time scale, 
of decades, we are not going to be what we are right now as, as we are already different from what we were 20, 30 years ago. So just to give you a quick example, um, our relationship with our cell phones, right? So the vast majority of people in this planet have cell phones, and these cell phones are not just interesting little things. They are really extensions of their selves. Mm -hmm to the point that if you look at different cell phones, they're all gonna have apps, right, the different apps, and we all have some, some similar apps, but each cell phone will have a very unique collection of apps because that is a digital fingerprint, that is an extension of who we are already projected into a machine that is able to take you into other places, transcend the flash, and take you into other places across the world in a flash. So this, to me, is really where it's going, you know, is, is, is the blending of humans with machines that is already happening is irreversible, and it's going to be deeply transformative. And in fact, we had a, um, our previous panel, no, in May, in uh, last spring, we had a panel at the Museum of Science in Boston on transhumanism, which is taking this to the very extreme, right, to the point that we, just become something very different indeed, and we're talking decades, we're not talking centuries and millennia and stuff like that. So it's food for thought, different ball game, but very important indeed, you know. One more question that gentleman had was up. Actually, I, I think he raised his hand right from the beginning. It's Dave. No, yeah, he gets the question. Just, <laughs> just a quick question. Um, yeah. As we're talking about transformation of our culture in order to deal with a threat to our species, and uh, I thought this was a really fascinating way of presenting it, and you're all academics. So it, academia is normally about the transmission of information, and, but I've heard it said that actually we are far more changed by stories than by the presentation of information. And I'm curious your thoughts about how we use that understanding that we need to use storytelling to change this incredibly difficult change that we're seeking for our survival. That's for you, that's me. <laughs> you're Thank doing you. it, you're doing it. Um, so I don't know how we will do it, you know, planet wide or throughout every uh, academy, but I think people are beginning to realize there's an increased um, interest in science communication. And a lot of academics know that this is, it's become part of the expectation, right? And that's how, that's one way of inducing a change. So if it's just the expectation that to get grants or to get tenure or whatever, to belong to the system, you need to have some part of you has to do this sort of public outreach. And I think most people who are doing public outreach are slowly beginning to realize that no one's gonna turn up if you just tell them facts you have to find some way of making it emotionally relevant. So a story is just the most generic and the easiest way. But there are other ways of making it emotionally relevant so that it matters, so that people remember what happened and that they begin to see why you should do it. I mean, I think the, the basic reason is why should I care? You know, great, you're doing this great research there in your little ivory tower, why should I care? What is it? So once you answer that question, and that's always an emotional answer. Right? That's always something that has to tug at you inside. It's not going to be your intellect. That's one of the reasons why we're having so much trouble with climate change, because you look at perfectly reasonable people, you tell them all the facts, they listen to all the facts, and they're like, okay, but we're gonna do this anyway. Or, you know, I don't agree with you, or I don't believe in science, which drives me personally insane. But the fact is, it's not necessarily that they're arguing with the facts, right? It's that I don't see why it should matter to me. And I think, um, a lot of us who do uh, outreach are beginning to realize that that's where we need to start. Yep. The facts themselves, it doesn't even matter. They're so prevalent, anyone could look them up. If they don't remember the facts, I have zero trouble with that. If people just go back with the sense of, oh, that's why it matters, and this is what it's doing, and there's just that emotional tug, um, it's a slow process because that's not traditionally what we're trained to do as academics. We're always trained to be, you know, I'm perfectly impartial, I'm perfectly objective, I'm completely removed from the situation, which is one of the reasons why I've become so passionate about this and what Marcelo said in the beginning, why I think science communi uh, communication needs to be so much more nuanced than it is. It's not just like I'm throwing facts at you. It's, I'm telling you what I do, I'm telling you why it matters and why you should maybe consider you know, coming along 
for the right. I think it's happening. I think the change is slow, but I think it's happening. And this is just to, to finish this up. I think that's also where the humanities have, they have a huge ro role to play, you know, because they are the consummate storytellers, you know, through fiction, through arts, through creativity. They talk about what is good, what is just, what is the reason, you know, to, to, to be human in a completely different dimension. And I think we really need to bring these two together in order to create this new narrative. It can't just be about the science because mm -hmm. they'll, they'll push people away. It has to be about the science and about the human nature of the people that make that science and why it is important for humanity as a whole to pay attention to some of these stories because they're about our future. Okay, folks, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>